you know, I, I used to think Afghanistan was complicated, but in light of the, the last presentation, I realized that it's actually not as challenging as, uh, as nuclear energy. But it still is challenging. And I think, you know, in light of General Petraeus's recent testimony and sort of the media reports that are saying there's been progress and then there hasn't been progress and sort of where do we stand, I thought I'd, I'd take some time and just give sort of a situational overview, sort of go around the country in a, as quick as I can. And, uh, and just sort of let you know where I think we stand. So what I'd like to do is sort of start in the north, end up in the east, and then open it up for questions on, you know, troop withdrawal deadlines and, and all that stuff, all the fun stuff. So, uh, you know, starting first in the north, uh, there's been this narrative in the north of the country where typically International Security Assistance Forces, ISAF forces, uh, or uh, Afghan forces haven't really focused. There's been this narrative that the north is sort of out of control, that the Taliban have taken over and have opened up a new front that we haven't been paying attention to. And this is something to be concerned about. The fact of the matter is that they have tried to open up a new front in the North, just like they did against the Soviets. And uh, they've largely failed to do so for a number of reasons. But they certainly did try to do that. However, the situation in the North is really not as dire as a lot of the reports make it sound. Uh, ISAF recently launched a couple operations up there that, uh, for the large part, dismantled uh, the Taliban's uh, sanctuaries that they had established up there and uh, have regained uh, control over some of the key north to south routes, including the uh, northern distribution network routes that uh, ferry a lot of the supplies that Afghanistan needs through the north uh, and have really pushed the Taliban back. And so, you know, they certainly do have a presence there, but, but it, it certainly is nothing um, that uh, poses a strategic threat for the security of Afghanistan. And so, for, for a number of reasons, General Petraeus and General McChrystal before him have decided not to commit significant resources in the north because they're needed elsewhere in the south and the east, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit as well. Um, when you go <clears throat> counterclockwise and you hit the west of the country, the west is important uh, simply because of its proximity to Iran, uh, but the Taliban's ability to operate there has, has been limited as well. They have not had the resources to really focus on the west and, and open up a major front there. So again, it, it's just like the North. It, it hasn't been an area where the, the, the commanding generals of ISAF have decided to send a lot of uh, international force, though the Italians actually do have responsibility for the West. Um, the Taliban have not been tremendously successful there. They still focus mainly in the South and then the East as well. But the Iranian influence is, is obviously distressing for a number of reasons. For one, uh, although they are Shia, they do support the Sunni uh, Taliban to a degree basically just to, uh, to make inroads against ISAF forces in Afghanistan. Uh, they're, they're not full backers of the Taliban, and, and uh, their reluctance to fully support the Taliban and provide them with man pads, uh, stingers, and, and uh, explosive uh, EFPs, which we saw in Iraq, uh, has not happened yet. And so, um, you know, it's important to keep a close watch on that, but I, I think the fact that that hasn't happened signals a little bit where they stand in, in relation to supporting the insurgency. So, but the Iranian influence in Afghanistan is not just in the West, in close proximity to their border, but it's also uh, in the capital in Kabul. And, and it takes a couple of forms. <clears throat> One of the most important ones, though, is simply paying off or bribing influential Afghan ministers and political players to, uh, to support Iranian interests in Afghanistan. And that, that includes territorial influence in the West, but also at a national level to um, implement some policies that are, uh, would be favorable to the Iranians mainly uh, to help keep out the Pakistani influence and some other issues. But, um, you know, this comes in the form of, of bribing ministers, and, and the bribes are not small bribes. I mean, they're in the tens, uh, tens of millions of dollars in many cases, and uh, these are well documented in New York Times and Wall Street Journal reporting. Um, so it's, it's distressing, uh, but, you know, they're obviously not the only country that's doing that. Uh, Pakistan's doing it, China's doing it, uh, Russia to a certain extent, uh, and the Indians as well. So. This is not a new phenomenon, certainly not for Afghanistan. Now, when we move to the south, this is really the main battleground between the insurgency and ISAF forces. It's where the majority of President Obama's surge forces went um, into the south, particularly Helmand province and, and also in neighboring Kandahar. These, these are really the two strategic centers of the southern, southern Afghanistan insurgency, but, but really economic sphere as well. And it's where General McChrystal and General Petraeus have decided to really um, to really send the majority of their forces, and I think with good reason. The most important thing, I think, to highlight is the, the success that those forces have had uh, since they've been sent there. Uh, in Helmand province, the insurgency has largely been routed, and um, 
they really pose no threat to the province anymore in terms of challenging what the Marines and Afghan security forces have been able to do. But I think more importantly, governance in Helmand has actually taken root uh, as well. So there's a number of district governors that are now in place, uh, and things, you know, things work relatively smoothly. Now, you could say that that's because there's, you know, 22,000 Marines and 8,000 UK forces there, and I think that there's definitely a lot of truth to that. But one of the things that we've, we've seen is that as our Marines and uh, some of the coalition partners have begun to pull back from some of these districts and let the Afghan National Security Forces actually take over, uh, this, this, this progress has not been reversed, and these guys uh, seem very capable of handling uh, what has been given to them by the Marines and the UK forces. And so I think that's a, that's a positive sign, and it certainly signals that uh, what, what is being built there does have an opportunity to last uh, long after uh, U.S. begins to pull forces out. Then in, in, in neighboring Kandahar province is also the site of a major offensive. This is mainly the U.S. Army, uh, but supported by Canadian forces and Afghan National Security Forces as well. And this offensive uh, really occurred uh, this past year and is continuing. And I think you'll see, as fighting season typically kicks up in the spring and the summer, you're going to see some pretty intense uh, combat for Kandahar. Uh, it is the Taliban's uh, spiritual and, and strategic stronghold, and it's something that I expect them to fight pretty hard to maintain. Uh, that said, their ability to really resist the, the offensive over the past year, and I think what will continue, uh, has been largely minimal. And, and they have taken a haven't taken a, a, a toll on U.S. and Afghan forces, but, but they by no means can really challenge uh, the full force of, of the uh, U.S. and coalition offensive there. So um, I think the South is, is actually progressing relatively well, and if nothing else, it's a, you know, when it shows that when you have a sufficient amount of combat force with the ability to really operate aggressively, you can make some pretty significant gains. And so uh, the South is, is progressing well, and, and that's primarily what General Petraeus pointed to when he gave his assessment and said that things are progressing well. However, they're fragile and reversible. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But I think at the end of this next fighting season, which will come towards the late fall, uh, we'll really be able to, 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 to make certain that that's the case. And then that fragile and reversible, I think, will, will start to sort of dissipate. Lastly, you know, you come to the East. And the, the East is significant because when we talk about groups like Al-Qaeda and others that are operating in Afghanistan or, or across the border in Pakistan, it's the East where these groups really show up. And they operate on top of platforms that the Afghan insurgent groups uh, use to wage their insurgency. And so the reason why I mention that is because without those Afghan insurgent groups, groups like al-Qaeda and lashkar e taiba and others uh, really cannot operate effectively in Afghanistan. Now, what I'd also say is that while you know, we have been focusing in the east for some time, there's about a half as many resources just in terms of troops in the east than there is in the south, approximately 35,000. And that's a problem because the terrain there is much more challenging. The population centers, which are the focus of a counterinsurgency effort, are, are much more diverse and, and sort of scattered. Uh, and there's just huge valleys and, and, uh, and, and mountains that um, is, is very, very difficult to have a presence in, patrol, or even really know what goes on there. So uh, the east presents significant more challenges, I think, than the south. Um, yet we have half as many troops operating there as we do in the south. So. Um, you know, while I talked about phase one was the south, I think phase two is probably the east. And what you're going to need, I think, is some more resources there, uh, but also some, some time to, to try to replicate what we've done in the south and the east. Although, you know, certainly it'll probably look a little bit different because of the, the terrain challenges and the population challenges. Um, the key focus in the east really needs to be degrading, but possibly even defeating these insurgent groups that operate there the groups that really provide a platform for al-Qaeda and lashkar e taiba and others to operate in Afghanistan. I don't, I don't think that we're going to be able to accomplish our objectives there unless we actually do take a look at, at these insurgent groups, uh, because simply focusing on al-Qaeda and lashkar e taiba and others uh, without attacking these groups I don't think is going to give you the sort of you know, long-lasting strategic success that obviously we're, we're pursuing there and have spent a tremendous amount of blood and pressure, uh, blood and treasure uh, to achieve. So. So that's the East. Now, on top of, of sort of my, my overview of, of, of the situation, I think that there's some challenges that are important to, uh, to highlight as well. Uh, not everything is a rosy picture, and I certainly don't mean to, to give that impression. Uh, governance and corruption challenges are enormous. Um, the Afghan government uh, has had tremendous challenges with this issue. It, it spans from the village and district level all the way up to the national level with President Karzai and others. And quite frankly, the U.S. And, and others who have tried to, to sort of address this issue have not had a tremendous amount of success. 
Now, there's a new task force that has been stood up in Kabul headed by uh, General H.R. McMaster, uh, who, who probably needs no introduction. Uh, but, but what I'll tell you is that um, he's been tasked with, with sort of trying to figure out this corruption issue and the governance issue and, and uh, figuring out um, really what to do about it. And it's, a, it's an immense challenge, but it's a relatively new task force. And I think, you know, w what I suspect is, is the changing Afghan political climate as a result of the, the parliamentary elections. Um, and then the 2014 elections, which of course President Karzai currently is not eligible to run for re-election, I do think presents some opportunities to, to perhaps, um, although it is Afghan-led and Afghan-initiated, um, bring about some sort of a change in the political environment that uh, reflects the desires of Afghans and, and sort of the, the direction that they want to go. Um, so th that still remains a challenge, though, and I don't want to sort of gloss over that. Um, obviously, of course, Pakistan is, is another major issue. What to do about Pakistani support for these insurgent groups that operate in Afghanistan? Um, quite honestly, we've tried just about everything from money to F-16s to counterinsurgency assistance, and it hasn't gotten them to change their support for these groups, uh, nor will it. The only thing I think that we can realistically do to change the Pakistani's calculus is to actually defeat or at least degrade to such an extent uh, their insurgent groups inside Afghanistan that they can then be persuaded to give up support for these groups in exchange for maybe entering um, in some sort of political arrangement rather than a military one that is damaging to everybody involved, including the Afghans, um, but still a tremendous challenge. And then, you know, the last thing, which perhaps, you know, while it's, it's certainly not an Afghanistan uh, geographical issue or enemy issue, it's, it's an American issue, which is the apathy that seems to be taking hold over the Afghanistan issue. And I mean, it, it makes sense. It's, it's been going on for a long, long time. Um, leadership in this country hasn't always done a great job of explaining why it's a necessary fight and why we need to win there. Uh, but at the same time, I think that rather than, than that, you know, driving what the end state or at least efforts to, to secure an end state in Afghanistan might be, the progress in Afghanistan should, should come back here and inform decisions that are being made here about the way to, to, to proceed there. And I, I haven't seen that happening, uh, obviously, as much as I would like or as I think needs to be done. But uh, I know General Petraeus and others, through testimony and a number of other engagements, uh, are trying to sort of get the word out about the successes that they are having there and, and certainly why, why it's important. So I, I know I'm not leaving a tremendous amount of time for Q&A, but I do want to leave some. Jeff, thank you very much. Um, that's a lot to jam into a short briefing. And uh, again, as always, I want to impress upon particularly the congressional staff members here, uh, these presentations are not meant to be all encompassing or comprehensive, but rather a sort of a, a, a taste test that uh, encourages you to drill down further with um, these experts and, and their colleagues at, at your convenience. Fred? The Taliban are largely sustained by revenue derived from opium poppy. What is the U.S. current policy? Is it still eradication or something less than that? Right. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's something much more than that, not necessarily always coherent. Um, but, but certainly is not, uh, is not eradication anymore. I know the previous ambassador, was a, Ambassador Wood, was a, was a big fan of that because he had come from Colombia, um, where I actually don't believe that, that approach succeeded either. But in any event, um, we're not doing eradication. W what, what I think has, has helped is our, simply our, our footprint on the ground allows us to drive the Taliban out, which, which in a sense was encouraging not only the, the, the cultivation, but the collection and defying the Afghan government's ban on, on opium uh, cultivation as well. So um, that, that, is, that is definitely an, an outstanding issue, although uh, I don't think it's, it's as significant an issue as some folks say it is. I mean, it's, it, it's definitely not, uh, I'd say it's less than the majority of the Taliban's funding. It's probably a minority because they, they get it from another, other areas as well. Um, there's been some success on, on the narcotics front, not as much as I would like to see, but um, you know, that involves our, our partners in the UK. It involves USAID and others in the assistance that they provide in terms of alternative livelihoods. So um, it is a challenge that will continue to be one, but one that, that I think can be, can be managed. Good. Uh, yes, sir. I wonder if you can speak to the uh, drawdown a little bit more yeah, yeah. and about the um, sure. consequences mm -hmm. if the president commences the drawdown as he's yeah. said that he would. Um, I mean, my own personal opinion of that is that we, we, we really – shouldn't be taking forces out of Afghanistan in July 2011 simply because the challenges that the theater still presents means that, you know, we, we certainly need all the troops that we can get there. 
Uh, what I would say is that, and this is just sort of me looking into my crystal ball, I don't have any sort of inside information or insight on this other than what I'm about to say, which is that I think that the drawdown probably will be minimal. Um, there'll probably be some combat forces, but not a lot uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think the majority of them are going to be combat engineers, logistics, and maybe some staff positions at headquarters to really try to minimize the impact. Um, that said, 2011, uh, while everybody sort of continued to harp on that, has really quietly become 2014. Um, and, and, and it is noticed and it is felt in theater, uh, but also, and I think more importantly, with Pakistan and others. And so while we do sort of uh, have a little bit of a wishy-washy position at times and sort of go back and forth on the deadlines, uh, I think emphasizing the 2014 as sort of the new date uh, is, is a tremendous gain, and, and I can certainly tell you it's having effects. Uh, that said, I, I, I would be hard-pressed uh, to, to find that we could withdraw a substantial amount of troops um, over the next year or two uh, if we're still set on accomplishing our objectives both nationally uh, but particularly in the East where uh, we really have yet to, to, to launch a, a major offensive. Jeff, just a clarification. Uh, what, what is the source of the 2014 date? Has it, has it countermanded explicitly the President's 2011? No, I mean, there, there, there still appears to be some ambiguity. I mean, I think the July 2011 date will come and go with, with relatively little fanfare and, and maybe some, a minimal withdrawal. Um, but the 2014 thing is an internationally agreed upon thing. Uh, it's something that President Karzai actually requested, and it's, and it's one that um, it is defined as the date at which we will transfer uh, responsibility for security operations to the Afghans. Um, so I, I think we're going to continue a presence there after 2014. I'm not sure in what size. Um, and until 2014, I think we're still going to be aggressively pursuing counterinsurgency strategy uh, would be my guess. Um, but certainly, the, you know, the ambiguity that, that persists is not a positive thing. But I would say that the, the, the impact of the 2014 becoming the new 2011, uh, it has been felt by those, both those in theater, certainly. I said, but just um, again, so I'm clear, 2014, not as a date for beginning a withdrawal, but a date when the handovers can right. take place and presumably enabling a considerable drawdown. Is presumably, yeah, and, and I think there's, there's sort of an understanding that there will be some drawdown as 2014 approaches, but you're right. I mean, that is sort of the, the goal for uh, full transition to the Afghans. Okay. Anybody else? Ben? Um, Jeff, what's your take on the rules of engagement for Afghanistan? <clears throat> My impression has been that the well-intended in some ways, they've been counterproductive. What are your thoughts? That's a good point. Um, you know, the, the, the civilian casualties issue is, is a big issue, especially with President Karzai, for understandable reasons. But what I would say is that, you know, the, the altered rules of engagement um, have had a, a profound effect, while at the same time has really enabled special forces who are doing these, these night raids and capture and kill missions uh, to, to, to still go at it pretty hard and, and make substantial gains against the insurgency. Um, civilian casualties have actually been reduced, at least those caused by the coalition, despite 30,000 troops that have entered into theater and much more aggressive special operations actions. 75% um, of all casualties are actually caused by the Taliban, which unfortunately is something that uh, President Karzai has not chosen to highlight, which I think you know, would actually be, be a very large benefit. Um, but I, I think it was actually a good thing, and I think, um, you know, in analyzing that with taking a look at civilian casualties, but also the effectiveness of special forces means that, you know, it probably was the right decision. And I don't think really hampers our forces' ability to do what they need to do. General? I, I'd like to know your perspective on the role Central Asian nations are playing in this overall s support for our efforts. I say so with one antidote in mind. I, I had the opportunity the last several years to work with General Petraeus in trying to address our theater, theater security support for Central Asian nations. Working with them one-on-one, -on -one, it went very well. But we could never get a collective body together to do anything meaningful to support what we're doing. Do you see any change to that? Uh, are we positive or have we given up? Uh, I don't think we've given up. In fact, one of the things that that I think could you could you just is it necessary to do it on a basis that's other than one on one? I mean, what 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 are the imperatives here in terms of having some sort of collective effort rather than individual? Uh, predominantly, the role of uh, predominantly the role of transportation, uh, predominantly the role of border security, predominantly the, and in addition. Uh, 
uh, drug enforcement. You know, w we found out that nations would not work with each other to try to address uh, border security issues or, or, or security of our own forces through there, and, uh, and particularly drugs. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually know um, how things are now versus a couple years ago. What I would say is that, you know, surprisingly, Russia has actually played a, a helpful role in the counter-narcotics effort because they're concerned about the drugs that are being trafficked through there into their country uh, and the rest of Europe. Um, <clears throat> Counter-narcotics is a huge issue in the North. I mean, the, the smuggling routes that, that go into the stands are tremendous, and it's one of the things that the Taliban try to get a hold of to actually make up for their loss of revenue in the South, which is interesting. And we also know that Afghans uh, and others are fighting over these routes. Um, but, but one of the things that I think is most important with respect to, to the Central Asian states is this northern distribution network. Um, the majority of supplies for the effort in Afghanistan still come through Pakistan. That's a problem because it, it, it creates dependency issues and therefore sort of uh, hampers our efforts to do things on the, on the uh, counterintelligence, excuse me, the, um, the, um, the really aggressively pursuing, yeah, exactly, aggressively pursuing the enemy in Pakistan. Uh, so, so one of the issues that we're looking at is, is maybe trying to expand the Northern Distribution Network and, and bring in more supplies through there and sort of what that will take. And, and I understand that some, some folks, you know, looking at that, not in an official capacity perhaps, but, but certainly in a, in a private one. Uh, and decreasing our dependency on Pakistan. I think if that can happen, and there's reasons why Central Asian states would, would want that to happen, it can be a, a, a significant development, and it might actually create uh, a platform from which to expand cooperation efforts.